Anyway, so back to our uh, Mercator projection of the world. We talked about the Molnia orbit. That's the one, the satellite that has a periodicity of, of 12 hours. So basically, it, it was the one that was inclined, so it went over North America, then it went over Russia, and uh, kept repeating that, making two cycles per day. Now, there's another orbit related to that Molnia orbit. It was also developed by the Russians. I'll go ahead and sketch it out on this board over here. If this is the Earth, here's the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. If we take that inclined elliptical orbit, if we stay on that nice, stable 63 degree inclination, and we stretch it out so that now it is geosynchronous. It's inclined and it's eccentric, so uh, it's, it's not geostationary, but it is geosynchronous, one sidereal day around here. The ground track for that looks kind of interesting. It doesn't travel about the world since the mean velocity is the same as the mean rotation of the Earth. So there's no net movement over the course of one day. However, there will be some higher coverage at northern latitudes uh, and, and also some some faster motion when it whips around at perigee. This is a little bit, of, let me exaggerate this a little bit. If we have an eccentric orbit where perigee is on the southern hemisphere and apogee is on the northern hemisphere, you'll actually see a wobble. And it looks kind of like a bowling pin, the ground track when plotted over time. And so the ground track actually looks like this bowling pin. And if you wanted to like animate it with respect to time, the satellite whips around the perigee because Kepler's second law says it should travel faster. That's, of course, in the southern hemisphere. So this, this travels down really quickly, comes back up, and then slows down. And this is actually a nice uh, Earth orbit in terms of look angles when you want to cover something at very high uh, latitudes. Because if you think about it, like when you, if you do the look angle calculation for you know, high spots in North America for di their dishes and how they're pointed uh, towards the geostationary Earth orbits, you find you start to get really low look angles, you know, like 20, 30 degrees when you're really high up in Canada. And of course, once you get that, that low, the, the satellite dishes are pointing pretty close to the horizon. Mountains and trees and buildings and other things are, are blocking and can degrade the link. A lot of the satellite links, especially the high frequency ones, they don't really diffract because the frequency is so high in the millimeter waves or in the high microwave band. And so if something gets in between you and that link, you're going to lose it. Um, and so, but this is actually a trade-off. On one hand, well, you have one problem. It's not stationary, right? You wouldn't be able to do this with actually a DISH satellite, uh, you, unless it had tracking capability. Or you could do it with maybe an array. An array, you can electronically phase things. So even if you're not moving it, it can phase the elements of the antennas together and track this satellite in the sky. And it won't move that fast. It spends most of its time in this upper, upper apogee track which means that probably more than 50% of the time, you're getting pretty good coverage directly overhead. Yeah, Nathan? Uh, what was the name of this orbit again? Oh, this is a tundra orbit, also developed by the, the Russians. Tundra orbit. And so if you wanted to broadcast to North America, this might be a really good alternative. And so that's exactly what the, the Sirius satellite radio did. They put three satellites in uh, this tundra type orbit. The reason why they put three in there is so that there would always be at least one over North America and the other ones would be on the fringe of coverage or zipping around the, the backside of the planet to try to get back up to uh, North America. And in doing so, you create a really nice coverage for these high latitude places. And you know, for, for satellite radio, most of the, the <coughs> users are sort of mobile, right? You put your antenna on your car and you drive around, you can listen in your commute. They don't have the ability to point the dish anyway. Now this is a slightly different 
strategy than XM Satellite Radio. Of course, the two merged last year, so that's all one big satellite radio company. But Sirius, they had three in orbit, in this tundra orbit. And for XM Radio, they had two satellites in a conventional geostationary orbit. One, one satellite was called Rock, and the other one was called Roll. And they would sit there, and they'd cover the Earth. And for, for Atlanta, that's a good deal. You know, we get really good coverage. We can have our, we, we did this calculation at the beginning of class, I think. We uh, look angle calculation where we, you showed you can crank the dish up to about 45 degrees and get a geostationary Earth orbit satellite, plus or minus, depending on where it is on the longitude. Uh, but when you, get, uh, when you get higher, those geostationary satellites get more obstructive. They got a little bit longer distance to travel. And uh, the Sirius works a lot better. Um, and, but in some ways, they're, they're, their service is very complementary. There are some situations where you would prefer XM satellite radio, perhaps even in the, the northern uh, hemisphere. If you were supplying your digital radio to an office building and had the freedom to fix a directional antenna onto your building, then you know, the geostationary coverage would be the way to go, right? take your Yagi or your dish or whatever and point it, make sure you had some clearing in the, in the terrain and the foliage, but point it down south, you'd get a really nice gain and you probably would get overall better coverage than you would if uh, you had this serious orbit. So some of their functionality is somewhat uh, orthogonal.